Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to how Britain is turning the North Sea into a massive power plant. For once, I think it could be a positive video on my country. And I mean, like, living here and like when you go to the beaches and stuff, you do see... I guess it's, this is to do like wind turbines. You do see a lot of wind turbines on the coast when you're at the beach and stuff. I didn't know this was a thing that Britain was like, I guess, prospering in. I just thought it was a very common thing to have wind turbines in the ocean which i think it probably is but maybe the uk is just more extreme with it or they're they're in a better location for it i'm not too sure but we're going to check this out and see hopefully going to enjoy and let's jump into this video the sea cures all ailments now it stands to cure the craving for renewables this map of the north sea identifies high wind areas for power generation the waters surrounding the united kingdom are marked in dark purple indicating an average speed of over 10 meters per second at 100 meters elevation. For a potential wind farm, this is prime real estate. Yet, the North Sea is a tempestuous place. For much of history, it was a battleground. Today, it is prized for its hydrocarbon reserves and abundance of fisheries. But the North Sea is also home to some of the world's busiest ports. Roughly 250,000 container ships pass through it each year, making okay. it one of the planet's most capital wealthy places. Britain has a lot to be thankful for, but the thirst for renewable energy is growing, and British lawmakers want to transform the North Sea into a gigantic power plant to <clears throat> meet their needs. Oh, so they're going to be doing this. It's not like it's done, because okay, they've already got a lot of turbines that you see, but okay, they're going to go, I guess a lot crazy with this which i guess makes sense the plan in motion is <coughs> one of tremendous scale affecting tens of millions of households and revolutionizing the geoeconomics of the periphery britain has vowed to become the saudi arabia of wind Damn. but acting on a whim is not the way to go the sea has endless patience sometime or other it will find out everything you did wrong okay Today's video is sponsored by Enlisted. Secure in the bag as well. Get that money, baby. Um, what's the ad name? It's a long ad. Go on, bro. There you go. Enlisted, get it now. Located at the nexus of northwestern maritime Europe, the North Sea touches the coastlines of six highly developed economies. Britain, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, and Norway. His this is my terrible geography knowledge. I didn't even realize Germany was on the coast here. This is the f oh my god. I've never clocked that. Germany being on the coast here has blown my mind. So basically, part of Germany actually faces like Newcastle in England. What the f what? Historically, the region's temperate climate and fertile soils complemented abundant timber and hydropower, fostering intensive agriculture and dense human habitation. Meanwhile, its wealth of natural harbors, coves, and fisheries geared its economies towards port development and maritime commerce. British and Dutch sea power gave rise to expansive colonial trading networks facilitating inflows of cheap raw materials and outflows of manufactured goods. This system privileged the nations by the North Sea and transformed them into industrial hubs. And though initially powered by coal, by the late 20th century, North Sea oil and gas became a major energy resource. Now, however, as economies move to renewables, the North Sea has emerged as a promising high-value hub for harvesting wind power. For added context, strong and consistent winds exist in many places. But what makes the North Sea's wind power unique and commercially feasible is its proximity to coastal population centers and its existing seaport and energy infrastructures. Equally important, the sea's average depth sits at 95 meters, which makes installing wind turbines in fixed places more practical. It's a very shallow 
ceiling, isn't it? Very shallow. Cool. By and large, strong winds, shallow waters, and existing infrastructure make the North Sea an exceptional space for renewable energy. No other place on Earth is quite like it. This is especially true in the British territories, which include the English Channel, the Celtic Sea, the Irish Sea, Dover Strait, Dogger Bank, Thames Estuary, and the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. Currently, there are over 40 wind farms in the North Sea, totaling around 2,630 turbines, with an offshore capacity of 30 gigawatts. In layman's terms, that is enough to power roughly 8.7 million households. But the nations surrounding the North Sea have big plans. Renewable energy demand is increasing rapidly, and production must keep up. In April 2023, nine European leaders pledged to increase the North Sea's offshore wind capacity to 120 gigawatts by 2030 and at least 300 gigawatts by 2050. That is an incredible tenfold increase in capacity when compared with today's settings. But turning the North Sea into a gigantic power plant is not easy. Technical considerations are plenty. Currently, monopile turbines, which consist of a steel tube driven into the seabed, are the cheapest solution. Yet, their operation is generally limited to waters shallower than 35 meters depth. Suction bucket structures, meanwhile, use three foundation piles, are more stable, and can be used at greater depths, though they are more expensive. Jacket structures are likewise generally costly and are more complex, but are also more hydrodynamic, and some variants are relatively cheap, even compared to monopile turbines. Floating turbines, by contrast, Float? are attached to the seabed by cables or chains. The main types being tension leg platforms, oh, they float. What the hell? semi submersible types, <laughs> and spar buoys varieties. Though monopile wind farms currently have a dominant share of the North Sea, the first floating structures were installed in 2017, and their use will only increase over time as wind farm development wades into deeper waters. God, having, having the job of like installing these. No, thank you. No, thank you. Simultaneously, on the surface or just underneath, ocean movements can be harnessed through wave farms. Two decades ago, the world's first commercial wave power device was installed on the coast of Islay in Scotland and connected to the British national grid. The yeah. experiment was a success. Now, the European Union wants to increase the output of wave power to at least 1 gigawatt by 2030 and 40 gigawatts by 2050. Clearly, that much wind and wave power must be handled with great care. Linking the individual, domestic wind and wave farms to a common energy grid shared by the regional nations would allow for more efficient energy allocation and improved load sharing. In this, the United Kingdom and the Netherlands look to connect offshore wind between their countries. It's a first-of-its-kind power link where a Dutch offshore wind farm would connect to the British national grid. If successful, oh, wow. it could set a precedent in the North Sea and allow other nearby nations to join the British-Dutch initiative <coughs> or set up their own energy interconnections altogether. Another concept that could yield results is by way of creating offshore artificial energy islands. Dutch, German and Danish lawmakers are currently negotiating to construct an artificial island at the point where the territorial waters of the Netherlands, Germany and Denmark come together in Dogger Bank, just outside the continental shelf of the United Kingdom. Thousands of wind turbines would be placed around the island and, according to a Dutch study, as much as 110 gigawatts of wind energy could be generated at the location. However, while the Europeans negotiate, Britain is years ahead of the game. On the western half of Dogger Bank sits the Dogger Bank Wind Farm. It is a cluster of offshore wind farms that is under construction. Upon completion, it will power up to 6 million homes annually, making it Britain's largest single source of renewable energy. Finally, in addition to wind and wave power, floating solar panels could also enable seaweed farming, 
a potential source of seaweed farming, animal feed with other commercial applications like cosmetics, bioplastics, and biofuels. Seaweed and kelp are also effective at pulling short-cycle CO2 out of the atmosphere. This is because, unlike trees, which release carbon back into the atmosphere once deforested, kelp biomass can sequester CO2 on the seafloor. Likewise, regulatory coherence across different jurisdictions and infrastructure standards will pose a barrier. Cross-border market integration for wind power is widely seen as necessary, but the approval process for such projects can involve multiple authorities, causing delays. Plus, revenue-sharing arrangements between generators and transmission companies will also need to be settled, which could take years. On top of everything, there is Brexit. It complicates British integration into the European energy landscape. Meanwhile, Scottish independence, if it ever comes to that, would make things even more complicated. Scotland's maritime borders are fixed by regulations made under Westminster laws. But they get massive. Look at that, this goes all the way out here. They're living good. In the past, <laughs> Scottish interests have challenged the means used to calculate the border. And hydrocarbon resources, in particular, have fueled separatism in Edinburgh. Leading up to the 2014 independence referendum, nationalist campaigners noted that although London had collected £300 billion in oil and gas taxes since 1973, nine-tenths of that revenue emanated from Scottish territory. Oh, damn. So, in the event of a divorce from London, both the maritime border and the split of ocean resources and assets will be open to dispute. But while political disagreements come and go, wind power is not inexhaustible. Contrary to popular belief, wind is something of a finite resource. Clustering wind farms together can crowd out their power generation potential by causing wake-induced power losses, thus decreasing their efficiency. So cross-border optimization will be needed to ensure greater yields. All things considered, industrialization began in northwestern Europe. The North Sea has long provided the region with fishing grounds for its food, sea access for its trade, and hydrocarbons to power its industries. The transition to renewable technologies is the latest stage of its exploitation. But no natural resource is a bottomless pit, and even the greatest free lunch will not satisfy an endless appetite. I've been your host, Shirvan. Well, there we go. There we go. I mean, it's fascinating. Where Scotland could get a lot of it for themselves. As someone working directly in the offshore wind industry and UK projects, it's great to watch this video. I mean, it seems like it's somewhat of a positive for once, which is always interesting. Um, I never thought that strong wind would make you feel patriotic. Um, but there we go. Hopefully you found this interesting. I guess some of you maybe knew about this more than I did. But um, yeah, that's that. Until next time, like, subscribe, and peace.